Hello everybody, sorry for the slight delay in starting the uh, webinar. Unfortunately, Hakon, our host, is uh, having trouble connecting and um, so we're playing a little catch up. But uh, what we have today is, is two really outstanding talks from different parts of the universe. We've got Stella and Anna talking about sites in Cyprus. I'll introduce them both in a second. And Eleanor will be talking about sites in uh, a completely different continent in Latin America and Caribbean. Uh, she's currently attending a meeting in uh, Cadiz, uh, so her presentation will be uh, presented, let's say it won't be live, so it won't be Elena, but the recording. Okay, um, just want to introduce Stella and uh, Anna. Stella has sent us a CV and a brief CV. She has worked for the Establishment of Maritime Archaeology in Cyprus in different capacities. Um, in 2011, she has created the Maritime Archaeological Research Laboratory, MariLab, um, at the Archaeological Research Unit of the University of Cyprus and since 2014 she coordinates the Master's Programme Field Archaeology and Land and Underwater in the Sea in the Department of History and Archaeology. She has also been very active in the field. She has organised six underwater archaeology schools in the island, um, three by herself and three in collaboration with the Nautical Archaeology Society who you will be familiar with and has conducted several sort surveys in the Cypriot coast. She is, um, she has completed her undergraduate studies in archaeology in 1992, University of Athens, uh, Department of History and Faculty of Philosophy, continued at the Department of History and Archaeology, University of Cyprus, where she received her PhD in 2002. She first worked for seven years for 2000-2006 at Piraeus Bank Co Group Cultural Foundation in Athens, Greece, as head of the museums department, and after 2006, as Vice Director of the Foundation. In 2006, she also taught maritime archaeology in the University of Peloponnese, Greece, and since 2007, she lectures at the University of Cyprus. So you can see from her CV, very broad, very deep, and I'm especially interested because Stella's going to be talking about engaging with the public. Just read you what I have for Anna. Anna Dimitrio is a research fellow at the Maritime Research Lab that's Marilab 2 of the University of Cyprus. She holds a BA in archaeology, an MA in management and archaeological sites, and a PhD in maritime archaeology. She has participated in terrestrial archaeology projects in Cyprus and Greece and has undertaken the preparation of museum exhibits in Cyprus and the United Kingdom. Since 2008, she has been involved in different aspects of marine cultural heritage through her engagement in several underwater archaeological projects in Cyprus and the development and implementation of a number of educational community programs. Her particular research interests focus on the examination of ancient shipwreck sites as places of interaction and engagement in contemporary society. So again, the, com the, the, the two of them bring together a huge amount of experience from, from the Eastern Mediterranean and particularly in this presentation with education and, and public engagement. Uh, Stella, are you starting? Would you like to share your screen? Yes, yes, of course. Can you all see my screen? Yep. Thank you, Stella. Maybe. Perfect. Yep. So uh, thank you, Chris, for this introduction, the kind introductions. And of course, thank you and Tekan both for, uh, the, for organizing this webinar series. And uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, I don't know, to everybody that is with us. Uh, so we will start uh, with the Mediterranean as Chris said, uh, and the island of Cyprus. Well, underwater archaeology was uh, only recently established in Cyprus. And uh, by that, I mean that it was only recently introduced in the local universities and institutions because uh, underwater archaeological activities have taken place in Cyprus since the early days of our discipline. Uh, in total, 19 shipwreck sites have been located around the island during the last 50 years, dating from the classical to the medieval periods. In most cases, their survey was restricted to their report, inspection and photographic documentation. Today, we will discuss two of them, which stand out for various reasons. They were both well-preserved almost monumental 
for ancient shipwreck standards. They were systematically excavated and public awareness activities have been organized around them. The first is the Kyrenia shipwreck. The excavation there commenced in 1967 by the University Museum of Pennsylvania under the direction of Michael Kadzev. It marked a turning point in the history of our field because it brought to light an early third century BC ship and her cargo in a state of preservation that was unprecedented for the period. Retaining a good part of its original structure, the hull of the ship was lifted, conserved, reconstructed and published. Thus, the shipwreck, especially the ship, gained an exceptional place within the field of nautical archaeology, a place that uh, uh, she still holds. The exhibition of the ship and the finds was organized at the Kirinia Castle very early. Uh, which, the castle I mean, gradually became the second most popular historic monument of the island back then because of this exhibition. Although the political conditions of the, uh, on the island after the excavation and exhibition have been difficult in many respects, the study continued with one of the most successful experiments in nautical archaeology, a replica ship that was built in Greece based on the reconstruction work of Richard Steffi and Michael Gadzev. 30 years after her launch and after several successful experimental trips, Kerinia II, that was the name of the replica ship, was granted to the Thalassa Museum at Agia Napa, Cyprus in 2006, where she has been exhibited ever since. But there was already another fully operational ship in the Cypriot waters, the Kerinia Liberty, another replica ship that is, which is still used for sea trials and training. Gradually, the ship of Kerinia, not necessarily the shipwreck, became part or even a telling symbol in the contemporary Cypriot society. The second shipwreck under discussion was discovered 40 years after the first. It was the Mazoto shipwreck off the south coast of the island. It's dated to the first half of the 4th century BC, and it was a ship carrying wine, uh, from, wine in transport and foray from the island of Chios in the Aegean. The wreck was reported to the authorities by two divers in 2006, and the team of the University of Cyprus has been working at the site uh, from uh, since 2007 until today. During the 14 uh, field seasons that have been organized all these years, a total of 151 divers have participated uh, in the project. That's uh, 14 field seasons, there were survey and excavation seasons. A lot of the divers have come from abroad, but a growing number of local divers have also participated and have become aware of how important it is to protect wreck sites. They have acquired the skills to assist with archaeological investigations and have come to acknowledge that maritime archaeology is not just about raising old artifacts from the sea bottom. It is not even fun diving most of the times. Building on this particular aspect of the project, the divers I mean, two public awareness activities have been organized in collaboration with the Nautical Archaeological Society. The first was a field school for technical divers. It took place in 2016 during the excavation season, and it proved to be a learning experience for everyone. We all realized that it was not easy to create an effective class on a complex and deep site. In 2019, therefore, we tried something different. 
with another project called Reaching Out. We offered the opportunity of engaging visits to local divers that had heard about the wreck during all these years, but did not have the opportunity to visit the site or take part in the project. The results gave us more food for thought. We all know that divers like to dive different sites, but it's hard to understand if such visitors were more interested in the diving experience than in the knowledge that we were trying to convey. They're doing both, most probably, but that uh, had uh, made us starting, start thinking of more effective ways to bring the public closer to uh, what we do at Mazotos, and you will hear more on this uh, by Anna Dimitriou very shortly. Our public outreach activities also concerned non-divers, of course. Over the years, several classes of archaeology students my students had the opportunity to spend time on board uh, our support vessel or contribute to the copious tasks of documentation or digital documentation in the office. The local pupils of Mazotos had often the opportunity to see our finds. And you see Anna here showing them to them uh, and develop their own creative activities at the local school afterwards. Whereas presentations of the excavation results at the municipality of Mazotos have created a bond between the village and our team. Beyond the village of Mazotos, we drove the Cypriot maritime bus, thanks to a funding grant by the Honor Foss Foundation. So we drove the bus around the island for one month in 2017. The mobile exhibition attracted more than 2,000 people who learn what maritime archaeologists do. And most recently, an exhibition was organized at the Thalassa Museum at Aia Napa, which was the del deliverable of an EU funded project called Aymare Culture. Uh, and the project was on virtual reality applications in maritime archaeology. So through this exhibition, visitors were introduced to a different kind of visit, a dry visit, as uh, it was called, to uh, a visit to the shipwreck through virtual reality. All these types of dissemination and public outreach activities are surely very well known to most of you. So our goal tonight is not just to show you what we did or what has been done, but take it a closer look at the public which we're trying to reach in order to understand better how different groups of people conceive our work. The two Cypriot shipwrecks that I have just presented very briefly made perfect case studies for this because they are so similar and so different to each other at the same time in many respects. Dr. Anna Dimitriou has conducted her PhD research on the topic and we'll share with you the results of your work. So up to here now, Anna. Thank you. Uh, before I talk about the research I have done, let me outline its general context by taking you years back to my first contact with shipwreck archaeology when I was still in the primary school. I still remember the intense emotions my teachers conveyed to us about getting a two and her sailing. Their narratives were further enhanced to my mind by the multiple images of the ship through different means, which reflected her great impact among the Cypriot society. Years later, my professional involvement in the field gave me the opportunity to engage in casual discussions, mainly with divers participating in the Mazotos shipwreck project, but also with fishermen and locals. There was a common denominator among them, a subtle sense of attachment with the site. In an attempt to achieve a deeper understanding of the contemporary social context of ancient shipwrecks, during my PhD research, I undertook an ethnographic survey around the different public groups associated with the maritime and the terrestrial spatial context of the Gerinya and the Mazotos shipwrecks. 
the interviews conducted enlightened several parallel stories of values and uses of the shipwrecks that were up to that moment silent. The Gerinha shipwreck excavation started soon after the location of the site and its report to the authorities and was completed within two years. This fact generated strong stimuli among the locals whose life revolved around the port's waterfront. They were able to see on a regular basis the archaeologists unload the amphora lifted from the shipwreck at the harbor, and later on, the timbers of the ship being transferred to the Gerinha dock. Their experience was enriched by the national and international interest around the site, as expressed through the presentations already described. The monumentality of the site fostered feelings of pride and ownership among the locals, while its temporality, to quote them, confirmed our roots. For the local community though, the shipwreck was not confined to an abstract association with the distant past. The shipwreck was linked with their present, to their present, their daily routine engagement with boats and the subsequent social relations that evolved around the sea. As this factor played a key role in the production of their collective identity, the locals of Kerinya felt an instant bond with the ship. It affirmed the most basic aspect of their identity, their maritimity, which they felt singled them out as a community. The intimate bond the locals felt around the Gerinha ship motivated them to seek an active role in the ship's contemporary biography years later. The second replica of the Gerinha ship, Gerinha Liberty, was constructed in 2003 on a local community's initiative. The primary role of Gerinha Liberty is to continue the experimental archaeology practices initiated with Gerinha II. The locals, who are responsible for the maintenance of the ship, organize and implement the experiments in collaboration with the Gerinha Shipwreck project team. In this way, they reproduce the activities and social relationships developed around the Gerinha Sea. In turn, these practices create new experiences and new social memories with reference to the past, which bond the locals of Gerinha together. At the same time, alternative practices were developed around the Gerinha Liberty. Over the years, locals have been engaged in teaching ancient sailing techniques to the public and have developed educational programs for school children, all on a voluntary basis. Stemming from a sense of pride and ownership, the locals participate actively in the research, protection, and promotion of an important aspect of their material past, which affirms their maritimity. The situation is more complex around the Mazoto shipwreck. Since the 1970s, when the site was first located by fishermen, Separate encounters were established around it by distinct social groups, from a distance for the local community, from the surface for the fishermen, and from the depths for the divers. Its report to the authorities in 2006 disrupted the existing dynamics between the shipwreck and the groups associated with it. Also, the fact that its excavation is still ongoing, 11 years following its initiation, set the grounds for the establishment of new relationships and the development of new negotiations around the site. Mazotos village is located just two and a half kilometers from the shore. However, the sea was excluded from the locals' everyday life. Therefore, the story spread in the village since the 1970s about the location of a shipwreck in the area never attracted their interest. Their detachment with the site continued during the first years following its report and the initiation of the Mazoto shipwreck project. Back then, the village had not been used as the base of the archaeological team. Therefore, the interaction between the local community and the archaeologists, the only possible mediators with the shipwreck, was for years non-existent. Despite the numerous presentations of the site in the national press, the land-oriented local community did not express any particular interest in the shipwreck. It was only following 2015, when the Mazotos team camp was transferred to the village, that the situation gradually changed. 
Even though the locals could not see any of the processes taking place on the site, their interaction with the team generated for the first time a bond with the shipwreck. This was enhanced by the several activities that took place. Although there is no cultural association between the village and the site, locals developed a sense of ownership justified by its contemporary spatial context. For them, the monumentality of the site responds to their need for a researched, scientifically legitimate past to differentiate them from other communities. These associations gradually generated an emotional bond, which as already described, engaged people in activities that strengthened their bonds with the site. The situation is different with the fishermen community, the first social group to develop interactions with the site when their nets were wedged under some strange rock that attracts fish. Used as a fishing ground, for the fishermen, the site was an important source of income. Moreover, the interactions developed around it as part of their everyday engagements in the sea involved practices that formed their distinct maritime identity. Its report did not affect immediately those associations as fishermen continued to use the site as a fishing ground. In fact, their existing connection with the shipwreck is so strong that despite our efforts to approach them, fishermen chose not to be engaged with the Mazotos shipwreck project in any way. Finally, the shipwreck was also engaged in a direct interaction with recreational divers since the 2000s, when deep diving expanded on the island. Particularly since the 2000s, the shipwreck was introduced to a network of people from different social and spatial contexts that could dive in deep waters and had heard about the shipwreck. It satisfied their passion to use their words to interact with places that no one else has ever seen before. Prompted by the feelings of adventure, achievement and liberation associated with diving, a strong bond was created between the huge and untouched, as they described it, shipwreck, often characterized by a sense of ownership. The temporality and monumentality of the site gave another value to the whole experience. The well-preserved shipwreck was inherently associated to the iconic image of the Gerinya shipwreck. The report of the Mazoto shipwreck disrupted the diver's established relationship with the site. It said as its primal quality, the shipwreck's archeological significance that needs to be preserved. Therefore, divers had to abandon their physical engagement, handing over its exclusivity to the archeologist. In this context, the initiation of the first underwater archeological project undertaken by Cypriot institutions displeased some divers who interpreted it as an intrusion into their established area of expertise. At the same time, however, as Stella already described, it enhanced new means of communication between divers and the shipwreck. Since 2010, volunteer divers, mainly from Cyprus, but also from abroad, have been engaged on a regular basis with the Mazotos Shipwreck Project and have gradually become members of the team. Volunteering their time and work is associated with their personal needs and aspirations. Participation in the project combines the adventure and fascination of diving in an ancient shipwreck with the satisfaction of contributing to its excavation. Through time, the interaction between archeologists and divers transformed the Mazotos shipwreck into a shared space of communication between the official and non-official approaches towards ancient shipwrecks. Divers had the opportunity to be actively involved in the official archaeological interactions with the site and learn the archaeological procedures and their significance. Archaeologists, on the other hand, had the chance to familiarize themselves with the feelings and meanings ancient shipwreck sites produced in divers. The experience gained through the excavation of the two well-preserved shipwrecks and the ethnographic survey undertaken highlights the grounds on which public outreach programs should develop. The public is not a homogeneous group of people. It is composed of separate community groups 
whose distinct social and spatial background and their separate encounters with the sea accord to the site's different roles and meanings. Research should embrace these complexities in order to develop activities that respond to the particularities and needs of each social group. Ancient shipwrecks generate a significant impact among the public, as the example of the Gerinya shipwreck underlined. In fact, the interest of the wider public is induced by the ship itself. The reconstruction of the Gerinya shipwreck, the Gerinya II, was an opportunity for the public to sense and visualize the ship in multiple ways and places. Through this, the public was able to appreciate the qualities and importance not only of the replica, but also of the shipwreck. Turning to the local communities, as they are spatially associated with the contemporary location of, ship, of shipwrecks, they connect the sites with their collective local identities and subsequently develop a sense of ownership around them. As our experience has shown, this bond cannot take a concrete form unless a direct relationship is carved with the local communities through alternative methods of approach. This may not directly serve the main scope of public presentation to raise awareness of the value and the need for the protection of ancient shipwrecks. However, encouraging the local communities to sense the site as their own and to play an active role in their contemporary biographies could in the long run prove to be invaluable for the protection of shipwrecks. Fishermen, on the other hand, although sensing shipwrecks only indirectly, create the most intimate bonds with the sites as they constitute part of their everyday engagements and the source of their livelihood. However, as the Mazotos case has shown, this relationship is so strong that any other activity developed around the sites remains beyond their interest. Finally, Divers represent the most complex community group associated with the sites. Training and incorporating divers in the archaeological team has certainly positive outcomes. However, this method of approach can only attract a very limited number of divers that have the eagerness and the time to devote to archaeological projects on a regular basis. In fact, what most of the divers seek is just to dive on an ancient shipwreck. In this context, visits to shipwrecks located in deep waters are different from those from visits to other types of sites, either marine times such as harbors or terrestrial. The immersion in deep waters requires technical knowledge and certain preparatory procedures. It also entails bodily, sensory and emotional modifications, which in most cases multiply with deeper, with deeper depths. For this reason, the primary incentive for divers to visit such sites is not always curiosity about the past, but the experience as such. This feeling is further enhanced by the fact that no complete interpretation can be achieved in the underwater environment, as the Cyprus example has indicated. Therefore, if raising awareness among the diving community is what we seek, maybe we should consider the type of experience one could offer around ancient shipwrecks in order to achieve a comprehensive presentation and interpretation of the sites. Thank you. Thank you, Stella. Thank you, Anna. Um, do we have any questions? And can you direct them through the chat? Somebody would like to put their hand up? I can, can you see anybody? I can't. Okay. Well, if nobody else is going to ask a question, can I make a couple of comments? Um, as both Stella and Anna will be aware, I, I've been had a good connect, a long-term connection with the NES and public archaeology in general. And I can say with my hand on my heart, that was extremely clear in dealing with all the issues from the early finding of a shipwreck. And obviously I'm thinking a little bit about the Mary Rose here in the background because it has a similar sort of trend and timeline and importance 
nationally to Cyprus as did the Mary Rose in the UK. But similar things appeared and the way you've articulated all of those issues, it sets an absolutely terrific, let's say, benchmark for people to look at. And I, I really hope people look at your presentation because it does identify the challenges, the need for inclusivity, all of the things that you guys will be completely familiar with, but some people starting public archaeology and knowing how to reach out to the public will probably be in a way lost because uh, it is quite challenging at the beginning. And I think you've refined that process. Clearly, it, 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 it fits the Cypriot um, requirement, which is obviously, you know, national identity. All of those things are important in this. Um, but I think it was extremely clear. So very, very many thanks from my point of view. And I hope the, the listeners felt the same about the presentation. Hakan, do you have any comments? I hear you joined us. No? No, thank you for your comments. Chris, indeed, you know very, very well uh, the challenges in uh, all these activities. Yeah. And uh, what we wanted to share with you is that uh, nothing is straightforward. Uh, mm. No, but no, we cannot just have um, uh, standard practices and to expect them to be uh, successful or have the mm. same impact everywhere in every site with uh, any public group this does not work anymore so yes there are standard practices but uh, all to take into consideration for sure yeah yes completely agree with that Stella everything has to be tailored to a particular site and and sort of local identity and local need um, any further comments before we move on to um, Elena? No? Okay, thanks uh, Stella and Anna. Super presentation. I think there ah. is a comment. Sorry. Oh, is there? Ah, sorry, I can't see it. in the chat. Ah, beg I, your pardon. Oh, you want me to read it? Yes, yes. Is this the one by uh, Hans? Yes. 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 So, Hans so has come. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. Uh, Hans is basically saying the focus on avocational and non-professional site divers is very much appreciated. We struggle with recognizing their contribution to UCH efforts. Do terms like avocational, recreational really capture their role? Good question, Hans. Very, very good. Especially recreational, I think it's completely yeah. wrong. Yeah. No, well, about avocational, I think you, I mean, the English speakers should <laughs> comment on this. But uh, maybe we're still looking for the proper word for them. Mm -hmm. we? <laughs> well, I'm going to, if I can be, I hope this is going to be recorded, isn't it? I, I guess. Um, it, it's this distinction between professional archaeologists and amateur archaeologists, which has been a challenge as well. And, I, and I'm going to throw out the challenges to how do we mitigate those two terms which are so seen in both directions in a sort of pejorative way. And um, we need the public to help us um, record sites. It has to be done under the right circumstances and with the leadership of trained archaeologists. But as you both demonstrated, there is a role. And I, I suspect within the, the current environment we're facing in terms of the challenges to heritage within the post-pandemic era, then we're going to need them more and the climate change we're going to need them more than ever so there's a challenge come up with another term yes <laughs> yes <laughs> okay fantastic uh let me i guess i'm going to have to share my screen for eleanor's presentation okay thank you chris Let's... we are going away thank you yeah please no you're very welcome Okay, over to Helen. I'll just um, give her bio. Helen Baba Maneke is a Mexican archaeologist who graduated from the National School of Anthropology and History, INA, of the National Institute of Anthropology of History, INA. She has a master's degree in nautical and underwater archaeology from the International School for the Doctorate in Sea Studies, uh, University of Cadiz, Spain. Uh, that's in, in fact where she re uh, is at the moment. She is a researcher at the Subdirection of Underwater Archaeology, responsible for the Yucatan Peninsular Office 
Uh, Mexico representative to the 2001 UNESCO Convention on the Protection of the Underwater Cultural Heritage, a member of its Scientific and Technical Advisory Board, having pre been previously its President. She is also a member of the Bureau of the International Committee on the Underwater Cultural Heritage and coordinator of the Scientific Committee on Underwater Cultural Heritage of the Mexican ICOMOS uh, Board. So an another person with a huge depth of experience and knowing um, this particular part of the world reasonably well and certainly this site, this uh, is going to be an exciting presentation. So if Eleanor was listening, I'm going to say over to you and I'm just going to press the go button. I can unmute me. Is that will that now? Oh, I Sorry, Hakan, if you're listening, um, somebody's raised the problem that they can't hear. Do you know how to share the sound? On minute. Um. Dear, Under, dear Dr. Underwood, when yep. you're sharing the uh, presentation, uh, you will see a little uh, box uh, about the sound. You need to check that and you need to uh, share again. Okay, where does it say that? Uh, when you press the share screen button, yeah. Uh, you will see the uh, screens and also you will see the little box, uh, the corner of the left corner of the window. You need to uh, check that uh, box for the voice. Is that WebEx? Is that right? Uh, I can share the video presentation if you want. Yeah, I think it may be sensible for you to do it. Yeah. Okay. Doors for this event and a coach, Hakanon is a Christopher Underwood. Next, I share the video of the conference titled Underwater Cultural Heritage in the Yucatan Peninsula, Mexico, uh, the submerged cave of Hoyo Negro. Uh, Quintana Roo. Uh, digital documentation and virtual access in an archaeological context of prehistory. This is called Turi with James Chatters, Dominic Rizzolo, uh, B. Petrovich, Blaine Schubert, and Alberto Blanc. I have uh, videotaped it for your science. I am the Science Congress in Spain. Uh, I thank the Master in Science, Diana Arano, for her reading. 
I take the opportunity to greet you all. The Yucatan Peninsula is a broad, low, almost level limestone platform formed largely during the Cenozoic as sea level rose and fell over a fragment of earth crust. During the interglacial episodes of Pleistocene's glaciations, when sea levels were at the maximum, a slightly acidic blackish water dissolved extensive karstic tunnels along the east coast of the peninsula. Rainwater expanded and decorated this when sea levels fell. Today, more than 1,650 kilometers of tunnels have been mapped within 15 kilometers of the Atlantic coastline and many thousand more are through to exist. During the glacial episodes like the Wisconsin, when sea levels were depressed as much as 130 meters animals and later people entered these tunnels through sinkholes, seeking water or refuge. Guide divers exploring the tunnels frequently find remains of megafauna like this stink gonfothir or this giant ground slot. They also encounter human skeletons, some of them like this Changhol specimen, representing the terminal Pleistocene or earliest Holocene. Recently, divers from the UNESCO recognize NGO Sindak discover extensive ochre mines 10 to 12,000 years old deep with the tunnels, providing direct evidence of why people enter the caves. The most spectacular of the finds in the caves is Hoyo Negro. The site was discovered in 2007 by another team of cave divers who had chosen the map a cave called Outland which is located about 10 kilometers north of the city of Tulum. As they extended their guidelines to broad, highly decorated tunnels where they encountered. An abyss that swallowed the lights completely, naming this the black hole, after the celestial body so dense not even light escapes. They return a few weeks later with better lights. They found the abyss was an immense well, bell-shaped chamber up to 45 meters deep and 60 meters in diameter. On the bottom, they encountered groups of large bones like this gonfotir and nearly a human skull. They keep the site in secret until 2010, when they reported it to the late Pilar Luna Regarena, direct, director of SAS INA. Thus was born the Ojo Negro Underwater Archaeological Project. In its 11th year, Project Ojo Negro has grown into an international consortium of archaeologists Paleontologists, geochemists, geophysicians, botanists, and computer scientists from Mexico, Canada, and United States. Project Hoyo Negro address a wide range of scientific issues, most notably bioarchaeology of the human, who has been Christian Naya, paleontology of many species found with her age dating and stable isobot analysis to determine the place the various species in the ecosystem. We have had to surmount significant technical problems in the course of this work, 
most notable the dedicated state of some of the specimens and the effect of diagenesis of our ability to date and study isopods of individual species. But the most severe problem has always been the deep and complete darkness of the gate itself. Working in Ojo Negro up to 120 meters from the nearest access point at a deep from 39 to 55 meters requires divers with boat, cape and technical dive training. Only two of our scientific team, both geochemistry, are cape divers and only one of these has technical training. As a result, most of the scientific of the team have never directly seen the site. We must use the divers who include the site original discoverers as their remote operated vehicles. Working with photos, videos and samples they bring to the surface, we work with them to devise a plan to see them into the deeps. Then wait nervously at the surface, hoping the plan was successful. Early in the project, we work only from photographs to study the deposits. As of this date, we have been able to identify at least 50 individual animals of 20 male mammalian species. Eight of these species are extinct included saber foods, gonfotiers, South American short-faced bear, acanid, and four species of giant ground slots. The range in age from 40,000 to 11,000 years old. The most important find in Ojo Negro is the human, Naya. At 30,000 years, one of the oldest and certainly the best preserved human skeleton in the Americas. Our initial goal was to study the site, particularly Naya, in place with just minimal sampling to determine her age and stable isotope composition. But early as 2011, it became apparent that unauthorized divers particularly guides bringing tourists to the site, pose a treat to its scientific values. We saw that between 2010 and 2011, Naya's skull has been moved, damaging some bones and almost losing a tooth into the depths. Thereafter, we have conduced a collection program that targets specific elements for recovery based on prioritized scientific question. Our work is facilitated by the use of high-resolution skate photographs and the three-dimensional models created from the using of structure from motion software. Nothing is collected until after a high-resolution 3D model is produced of it and its immediate surrounded. And with the saber tooth and peccary skull at left, the entire floor has been photographed from a grid set as a dip of 30 meters, allowing us to produce a low resolution model of the entire area. Now the walls and surrounding tunnels have been similarly modeled. The models are manipulated using 3D platform Viscore which combines models of all scales. These calls alert our non-diabetic scientific to study the site remotely, often in more detail than the divers can themselves with in person. I will walk you through some of the model's features, but first, a brief flight through the site.
at the small scale, the site is a form floated in space. With the ceiling of the cave removed, we can look down at the floor of the chamber from above. Or we can remove one side and see into the cave from the side, which shows us the unscaltable sloping wall of the trap. We can think slices from the model to produce illustration, like this north-south cross-section. We can use the model to study the specimen distribution. The high-resolution models representing fossil groups appear as bright yellow spots. In this image, which includes the slices from the chamber floats of this rim, we can see where those fossil groups lie in relation with the rim, which shows that animals do not lie where they fell from the rim into the floor, but probably fade into water and floated. Marking each of those bones closer with an X, we see a clear pattern surrounding the deepest part of the pit. This shows us where the pool of water lay. With an unusual dip of 40 meters, our human lay at the edge of this, this same pool. The model has measured function, so we can measure the distance in any dimension among the bones of a single animal. In this case, we are looking at groups of bones from one of the Shasta group slots in this site. This helps us understand the size taphonomy, which is further highlighted with, here with bones of another slot. The new genius species, Nohochichak, looking at the south work wall of the cave, we see the actual skeleton of the animal on the pit floor. And nine meters above of it, its arms, all at the deep of 40 meters. They show where the water surface lay as the animal decomposed. The west to east scatter shows that the animal's part drifted eastward. This pattern was repeated in nearly all animals, including Naya, providing she too fell into water. Working at a smaller scales, we have been able to inventory individual skeleton because bones are better lighted in the models than they are in persons for the divers to look under and around bones to better make identification and even discover new specimens. An example of this tiny skull of a spotted scot. Whether or not we collect the specimens, we can study them in detail inventorying elements, obtaining measurements or bones and preparing for recovery as index these examples of Naya. Here we see the leg and pelvis on, of four bones grouping from this young woman. Seen closer, we use the grid functions to determine her overall size and could even obtain an accurate measurement to correctly scale the box to recover those bones. Sure has a function allowing a portion of a model to be isolated and removed for use elsewhere. We have two examples. Along the south wall, we found a portion of the femur from a giant ground slot and needed to determine if it came from Nohochi Chak, the new species, or from another animal entirely. We painted the bone to isolate it, then remove it 
it and carried it across the Nohochichan skeleton where the left femur was similarly isolated. It was apparent these were not only different individuals, but different species. So we collect the fragment for identification. The best example of how Bishop worked for us in is the 2019 collection of the Sankratum of Nohochichak. Since here in its original context, partially buried in Wano. We painted the scene sacrum as before and our model developed, bit Petrovic, created from it a separate model, which he repaired by mirroring and sent to the mechanical engineer to design a crack bell for carrying the bone to the surface. The cradle was mean out of styrofoam and coated with fiber glass, with the styrofoam removed and hardware added. The cradle worked perfectly to bring 30 kilograms one meter wide bone safely from the cave. One of the most exciting uses of 3D modeling at Ojo Negro was the first. In 2011, the first year of field work, we obtained a structurally light image of Naya skull from wheat. A 3D model was produced. This model was printed to full scale and used as the basis for a facial reconstruction of the cranium in 2014. While the skull itself remained in the desalination chamber, it would, in this way, we were able to look at the face of this 30,000 years old woman before, and we have even been able to handle the skull directly. Our plan is for Biscor to be the platform for a virtual museum display of Ojo Negro so that this remote site is accessible to all, all, but a few highly trained adventurers can be visited as it was first discovered by anyone of any age. It will be a visit to a snack shop of terminal place to see life in the Yucatan Peninsula. Hello everybody, that would appear to be a fairly um, abrupt ending to the, um, the video. Uh, unfortunately, Helen is not with us, um, but if you'd like to put um, comments in the chat, then maybe we, or questions in the chat, maybe we can save the chat and, and send them to her. Uh, what I would say about that from my own perspective is that I had the, uh, I worked with Pilar and Eleanor on an NES course for the uh, the team it must be over 10 years ago now when they were first beginning to investigate and, and obviously declared the site to to Aina. Um, the group were highly motivated and I think I would like to think that Pilar and Elena would share my comment when they they have behaved without fault. They've uh, invested their own um, finances in the early days in creating a mesh or a block to the um, uh, the cenote. Um, clearly that wasn't totally successful, but they tried everything they could in their power, both within the, the law of Ina and Mexico, um, to make the site um, as safe as possible. But then when they started to work with them, they brought tremendous both technical diving skill, but also computing skills with them. Very smart group of people. And as Elena very clearly showed in the in the presentation the results of their work and has, they've continued to work with Aina all the way through for the last 10 or 11 years and I think it's fair to say that without them investigating 
this particular cenote, Ojo Negro, would have been very much more difficult. Um, and they are a credit to, to the uh, work that's been carried on in the, in the site. Um, unless anybody's got more comments to put in the chat, I think um, we can bring the webinar to a close with a final statement. If Hakan's there, uh, can you contribute, Hakan? If not, no. I would just like to say that I think we've seen two amazing exemplars of the public outreach and the benefits of working with um, the public in two very different sites, but two incredibly important or several very important sites and shows the amazing, ah, Hakan is in the waiting room. And it just shows the benefit of working together and the inclusivity and everything that comes from that. Um, two outstanding examples. So, unless Hakan uh, can talk, Hakan, are you, can you hear me? Can you speak? He's trying to connect to audio. It would appear to be impossible. Okay, everybody. Well, thank you for your patience today. We've had one or two technical issues. Apparently, the grey bands are um, something to do with settings and security, um, which are seemingly quite difficult to remove. But hopefully, in the next by the next uh, webinar in a month's time, we may have uh, sorted that as well. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining us, and see you next time.